connected with other believers and experience community. Here are those meeting this week. For a complete list of share groups and the times they meet, check our app or visit our website. First Friday Men's Breakfast is an opportunity to build relationships with brothers in Christ that go beyond saying hello on Sunday morning. They meet on the first Friday of every month at 7.30 a.m. To attend, simply fill out an RSVP form on the CCFW website or email Jeff at firstfriday at loveneverfails.com. Missions Fellowship meets on the first Sunday of the month after second service for a potluck lunch. For information regarding the fellowship or our global work in Mexico, please contact our missions coordinator, Paul Koo, at paul at loveneverfails.com. The women of Calvary Chapel, from preteen all the way up to retired, are welcome to attend Mary and Martha at His Feet Fellowship. This is a summer-long study and potluck fellowship where the ladies will encourage, admonish, and spur one another on to good works as women in the body of Christ. The first fellowship is on June 26th in the cafe after the second service. Contact Liz at info at loveneverfails.com for more details. Vacation Bible School will begin July 11th through the 15th from 6 to 8 p.m. Kids will unearth exciting evidence that proves biblical events are far more than mere stories. As junior archaeologists, our children will explore real-life archaeological finds that have shed light on the life of Jesus. Along the way, they'll discover the truth of Jeremiah 29:13 that God reveals himself to us when we seek and search for him with all our hearts. Kids ages 4 to 5th grade are welcome to attend. Servants needed. Contact Danielle Maka at danielle at loveneverfails.com. The Praise and Worship Team is currently holding auditions. If you are gifted musically, have experience playing an instrument, singing harmonies, or lead vocals, Jesse would like to invite you to try out. For more details, email him at jesse at loveneverfails.com. Thank you for your attention. Remember, you can get more information regarding any ministry and view all of our upcoming events by visiting our website or on the Calvary Chapel Fort Worth app. Have a wonderful day, and remember, love never fails.
Church, you may be seated now as we worship the Lord this evening with our tithes and offerings.
Good evening. Good evening. That's what I like to hear. Y'all are excited. <laughs> Amen. Y'all enjoying our Ecclesiastes series? Amen. Yes. Living life with the living God. You know, uh, Cisco, our pastoral intern last week, said, hey, how did Wednesday go? And I told him that the cloven tongues of fire set off the smoke detectors. So in case he asked, just back me up on that, okay? <laughs> we turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. 
And I have to say before we get into our text tonight, what a wonderful spring festival we had on Sunday. Amen. So many thanks to all of you guys who made it possible. It was a really neat event and my dog Gauss loved it too. She gave it, she gave it two paws up is what she told me. So, you know, y'all got to see her. But uh, before us today is um, probably the most well-known chapter in all of Ecclesiastes. It's definitely one of my favorites. And the title of the sermon tonight or our lesson is The Proper Time. We're just going to cover 15 verses um, this evening, so I won't keep you too long. But the question that's being asked is how do you and I regard the events and the circumstances that happen to us in, in this life? How do we see those things? What's our perspective? Do we see them as the proper time and that God is at work or do we see them as an inconvenience? But our God is not subject to time. He's the Lord of eternity. He's actually in control of time. And according to what we're gonna read tonight, he actually has a purpose and an exact season for every one of us, for everything that is done on this earth. He is not sitting by in the clouds and just kind of passively observing his creation. Our creator is intimately involved in creation. So our text is teaching us this evening is that God has a plan for you, a wonderful plan for you. And it's in his proper timing. It's in his way. And it's according to his purpose. So let's read our text real quick, starting in verse 1, chapter 3. To everything... There is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing a time to gain and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. What profit has the worker from that in which he labors? I have seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. I know that nothing is better for them to rejoice and to do good in their lives, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it, and nothing can be taken away. God does it that men should fear before him. That which has already been and what is to be has already been, and God requires an account of what is past. Let's look to the Lord in a moment of prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for the text that's before us tonight and just the wonderful opportunity that we have to be here together and continue to worship you throughout this evening. We just ask that you be with us in a special way. And Lord, your word teaches that you have a proper time, a proper season, that you're heavily involved in your creation and, and with your children. And so I ask, Father God, that you would help us to understand things from how you see them. What is your perspective? How can we truly enjoy life from your point of view and in turn bring glory to you and show others the love of Jesus Christ. So just be with us in a special way tonight. And Father God, I especially lift up our brother Ernest who is in the hospital right now dealing with blood pressure issues. We just ask Father God that you would just touch him right now and heal his body, heal whatever is going on. Give those doctors your wisdom and guide them with your eye. And we just ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus, we pray, and God's people say, Amen. Amen. So before us in these short 15 verses, actually, the name of God is mentioned nine times, rather by his proper name or the pronoun he or him. 
And it's interesting because it says that God has actually set, he has set a proper time and that he is in control of time. He has a purpose. And when it says a season, it means that he has an exact time for everything that is going to happen on this planet and on our lives as well. Now, man, we can't control the events and the circumstances in our lives, can we? No, we can't. I mean, for example, does anyone choose a time to weep? Does anyone choose a time to mourn? No. These things are imposed upon us in this life. And and what Ecclesiastes is making clear is that God has a proper time for everything. He's behind the scenes working, whether you see him or feel him or or, um, believe it, he's there. And he is never at rest. His work never ceases. And he is heavily, heavily involved in creation. Some people think, like the deists, that, you know, God kind of starts the clock and then just watches creation, you know, whirl on by. Well, that's not true at all. And so what we see from this in just the, the, these verses 1 through 8 is that God has a reason for everything that happens in our lives. Now, I don't know about you. But I often ask the question, God, why did you do that? I don't look at things necessarily as beautiful in their time as the scripture teaches. You know, if I get a flat tire during rush hour, the first thing that I think is, why me? Not, well, Lord, you've made everything beautiful in your time. You know, I mean, I was rear-ended by a driver the other day and he ended up taking off. And I didn't look at the damage of the car and say, man, you know, Lord, you made everything beautiful in your time. I mean, that was not my perspective. You know, it was, man, I'm going to hunt this guy down. And uh, praise the Lord, I did, and the cops got him. But that's that's another sermon for another day. But God is up in heaven, but he's not sitting as a passive observer. We have 28 activities of man. And, and of course, we're dealing with Hebrew poetry here. But it's organized in these 2 through 8, in these verses 2 through 8, in 14 couplets where four statements go together. And it's really quite beautiful. And and what's neat is, too, the last uh, word in each uh, couplet rhymes with the first word of the next. So this is actually some Hebrew poetry that rhymes. But I want you to look in verse 5 real quick. Because I think that this is the only one that is confusing, and and we need to look at it. It says, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. So what is that actually talking about there? You know, the first time I read it, I thought, well, is it talking about romance? You know, I mean, when's the time to refrain from embracing, right? I mean, (laughs) that'd be a question to ask. But we have to remember that the ancient world was an agricultural society. And you can read little glosses about this in Isaiah and in Kings, but casting away stones when it says that is actually referring to placing stones in an enemy's field before a military invasion. Well, why? Well, because it messes up their productivity. It's going to hurt their crops. And when it says gathering stones, well, that would be the time in which you would gather stones from the field to increase productivity. Now, that makes sense when you look at the next passage uh, when it says a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing. It's not talking, like I said, about romance. It's talking about the response to the invasion. There's a time in which you would embrace maybe a foreigner and say, hey, let's make a treaty. Let's have a pact. Let's be allies. But there's also a time when you would refrain from that and say, you know what? We don't know their motives. We need to be careful. We're not going to have an alliance with them. And so that's important that we see that because otherwise it's like, well, what are they, how are those actually related? But in verse 2 it says that there's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck that which is planted. And that's telling me something very important. It's telling me that God is in control. It's speaking of the providence of God. You know, he knew the exact day that we were going to be born. And he knows the exact day that all of us are going to die. And here he's telling us that these activities of life, that God has a reason, he has a purpose behind every single one of them. So this providence of God, the control of God, it actually resides over all the activities of man. 
every single one of them. And if, and if we perceive something as bad that happens in our lives, right, we put it in category bad, we start to question something, at least I do. And the question is, is, is God behind that? Has he forgotten about me? Is, is he really here? Am I the only one who thinks that way sometimes? No, you guys are mighty women and men of faith. You'll never think that way. But the question is, is, is God in control or isn't he? He is in control. He is heavily involved and he's intimately involved with his creation. And because of that, that means if God's in control, it means that he has a purpose behind everything that he does. And that's so important that we see that. In Psalm 115.3, it says, Our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. And then people will say, well, what about on earth? Well, Psalm 135, 5 through 6 says, For I know that the Lord is great, and our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth and in the seas and in all the deep places. I love what David said when talking about being formed before the womb in 139, 16 of Psalms. He said, Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they were all written. What was written? The days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. So God has a time and a season. He has a purpose. He has a reason for everything that is happening in our lives, which means he is in control. But that doesn't mean that we don't have the freedom to choose. Doesn't that blow you guys away? That God is in control, yet in the midst of all that, I have the freedom to choose? Man, it says in 3115 of Psalms that my times are in your hand. Well, that means he's in control. So that means, secondly, that, like I said, he has a specific purpose behind all that happens. That's the purpose of God. Now, this is important because, you know, if you study Ecclesiastes 3 and especially the whole book, but, but in this sp specific text, you'll find that people teach that God has overall purposes. Beware of that catchphrase, overall purposes. But they say, well, you can't say that he has a specific purpose. Yet the Bible teaches that he has a specific purpose for everything. And it says in Ecclesiastes 3.1 that his purpose is behind everything. And we see, man, so many powerful examples throughout Scripture. Uh, you know, the, the one that comes first to mind is in the life of Joseph. Uh, you know, there he was. He was sold into slavery by his brothers, put into a pit before that. But they couldn't stop the purpose of God. They couldn't stop it. And so years later, Joseph says to them in Genesis 50, 20, in a classic statement, he says, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. And I look at that and I say, God even uses the wrath of man to praise his name. And, but yet we fall apart in, in just the littlest circumstances. You know, we have a flat tire and we think the devil's under every rock and God hates us. This man was thrown into a pit, sold by his own flesh and blood. But they couldn't stop the purpose of God. Why? Because God is in control and he has a purpose for the lives of his children. And in another, another great example, how about in the book of Esther? Oh, I love the book of Esther. The whole book, God's name is not mentioned once, but he's behind the scenes working the whole time. You see the divine role of reversal and what a, a reminder to all of us that he's always there. And that Jewish girl ended up marrying a Persian monarch. And if you looked at that, no one would have said that would have worked. Amen? Amen. Said, man, what is going on here? This is going to be a disaster. And of course we know because of Haman, that wicked plot was devised to kill all the Jews. But Esther's uncle, Uncle Mordecai, he said this in Esther 4, 13 through 14 to her. He says, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And this is what he says. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. 
Man, God was working behind the scenes, and he had an exact time and an exact purpose. Why? Because he is in control. He has the final say. And no matter what man does, it cannot stop. It will not hinder. It will never prevent the work of the Lord. What he starts, he is going to complete, and even more so in his children. He has a purpose, and he has a reason for everything that is happening in our lives. We don't need to fall apart and despair. We need to turn to him and say, man, you must be doing something great. I can't wait to see what it is when it comes to fruition. His ways are past finding out, but that doesn't mean that I can't trust in him and have that peace and say, hey, I don't have to worry about this. He's got it under control. How about a New Testament example in Paul's missionary journeys? In the book of Acts 16 through 6 through 10, it says, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden, it says, by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not uh, permit them. So passing through Mysia, they came down to Troas, only other way they could have gone. And it said, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. So even in the midst of drastically changing circumstances, plans being completely altered, God actually stopped the original plan. And you say, why? Because he was at work fulfilling his purpose, not theirs. We are simply his instruments. We're to do what he wants us to do. And I love this because this was prevented by the Holy Spirit. We don't know how. We don't know why. It doesn't tell us that. But Paul didn't, didn't become discouraged and say, well, you know, the Lord doesn't love me. He didn't say, well, the Lord is against me. He didn't say, well, I'm out here doing everything right. I, you know, I, I, I'm sacrificing different aspects of my life, and where is God? He didn't say that. He said, God's at work. God's going to fulfill his purpose. We concluded, hey, we're going to go preach to Macedonia. Praise the Lord. But how often, and I look at this and I include myself, but how often do we put a circumstance in life and category bad and then conclude that God is against us or that he doesn't love us or that he isn't for us or that he's forgotten about us? Those are all lies from the pit of hell. The Bible says that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. Do you believe that? The three of you, praise the Lord. Listen, the reality is, is that the Bible says there is a time and purpose for everything that God is doing. I told someone that the other day, and they said, well, what about what's going on in Russia and Ukraine? Well, Acts 17, 26 says, and he, meaning God, has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times, and the boundaries of their dwelling. Well, that means that God has predetermined a time a nation will be in power. And not only that, he has predetermined the amount of territory that they're going to conquer. And it goes on to say, because why does he do this? You see, if he is in control, he has a purpose and a plan behind it. It goes on in Acts 17, 27, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. So God is even behind restructuring of nations. Why? So they will, it will cause them to repent and turn to the Lord. He has an amazing purpose, and he's always at work in everything that he's doing. 2 Peter 3, 9 reminds us that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And I hear Christians ask a lot of time, well, if God's purpose is so great, why hasn't he come back yet? Why is he delaying his coming? Well, it tells us right here. It says because he's long suf suf suffering, he's not willing that any should perish. And not only that, he knows every single person, every single soul that's going to be one, that's going to turn to him. And he is delaying it because he is long suffering. He's not willing that any should perish. We have a God who is love. 
But the question is, do we really recognize that there's a reason behind everything that's happening in our lives? That God is truly at work. That's his providence. He's in control. His purpose. He has a reason behind, uh, behind it all. But not just that, his power. Man, we serve the one true living God. And his power is insurmountable. He can cause anything to happen at any time he wants to happen. Period. He is sovereign. And I see an amazing example of that in the life of Abraham and Sarah. Remember 99 and 89 and God says, hey, you're going to have a child. Yeah, y'all would laugh too. It says in Genesis 18, 13 through 14, And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Surely I shall bear a child since I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, it says, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. So our God can do anything. He can cause anything to happen at any time to anyone, anywhere. Just like Job said in the final chapter, 42.2, in a beautiful speech before God, he says, I know that you can do everything. And not just that, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. And I look at that, I say, I don't honor and worship the Lord like this during all my trials, do you? I don't. Your house caved in and family's dying and everything that's happening and boils all over. And I'm saying, oh, you know, God is great. No, I'd be crying. I'd be saying, where is God? That's the flesh. But the thing is, God is always there and we want to honor him and we want to worship him in the midst of the trial, knowing that he is working all things for, together for good. It says in Isaiah 40, 28, one of my favorite passages, have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. He is understanding, his understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall, fa shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles, it says. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You know, I love that because it says like eagles. It doesn't say like blue jays or ravens. It says like eagles. And I find that a, an immense encouragement because if you know anything about eagles, even though we've designed fighter jets after them, the aerodynamic qualities. But what's so special about an eagle is the worse the weather conditions are, the harder the wind is blowing. That's when they really soar. They fly the best under those tempestuous conditions. And it's a blessing to me. That means in the midst of the storm, and I can sail like an eagle because my trust is in the Lord. You know, when we truly believe, and I mean truly believe in our hearts that God can do anything, that no purpose, no purpose of his can be withheld. Let me tell you something that changes the way you and I face trials and tribulations in our lives. We have these 20 activities of man here, and he asks a very in important question in verse 9. Solomon says, what profit has the worker from that in which he labors? So he's saying if God is control, what profit or what advantage is there in thinking that we're going to accomplish or change anything? Well, then he says in verse 10, I have seen the God-given task. Listen, never forget that whatever is before you, it is God-given, no matter how small or how meaningless you may think it is. Whatever is before us, we should do it and in turn bring glory to God. And no matter what it is, we need to remember that we serve him, not man. If my boss tells me to go mop, you know, the bathroom, listen, I'm going to mop it as unto the Lord because he's, he's the ultimate boss in my life. He's my source. He's not a resource. I've seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. He has made everything, it says, beautiful in its time. So he's just asking us here just to simply accept the fact that God's purpose is and control is over all that happens. 
doesn't really tell us much more except accept it. It's the truth. God has a purpose. He's working all things together for good. It says he has made everything beautiful in its time. But here's the thing. When you and I accept the fact that God is in control, when I know that he has a purpose for my life, that changes the way we evaluate things. It completely changes our perspective. And then I can actually say in sincerity, he has made beautiful, everything beautiful in its time. Is this how you evaluate the trials and tribulations in your life as beautiful? You see, we're talking about living life with a living God, and this is the perspective of how God sees things. This is how God, you know, he's up above. Solomon is talking about that which happens under the sun, meaning from man's perspective, but God has a completely different perspective. Have you ever thought about that? You know, it, it, it's funny. You know, I remember there was a, a little house that I had admired forever over in a real beautiful area full of mansions. I used to drive by it every day and say, you know, Lord, that would just be such a great house for me, you know? Sometimes he laughs at my prayer. Sometimes he doesn't say anything. He says nothing. And, you know, so I drive by it now than then. Well, then a couple of months ago, I was in a buddy's convertible doing some business for him and taking care of some stuff. He's disabled and thought I'd drive by that house. I said, oh, what a beautiful home. But my perspective was much different being in this sports car with the top down. And I realized that that beautiful little home was actually the servant's quarters for the mansion on the other side of the street. <laughs> you know, our perspective is everything. God sees it all. You know, we're so limited on the things that we see. You know, we, 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 we don't see the end game. We don't see, you know, how he's going to bring it to fruition. But he is. He is. But that's, for, that's how we see things, how God sees. And when we do that, well, that's how we become a Romans 8:28 Christian. That's when we can really say, I know that all things work together for good. And I believe that because I know God is in control and I know that he has a purpose. It doesn't say for bad, but it says he works all together for good to those who love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. So when we recognize that God is in control, that he's made everything beautiful and it's time, that's his purpose. It has a direct effect, as I said, on how we evaluate things, but it also changes our expectations. It changes our expectations. Look in verse 11. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. See, there isn't anyone on the planet who doesn't think about what the future or what eternity holds. We have a lot of kids in the youth group. They're getting ready to go to college. They are preparing for what? The future for eternity. St. Augustine said this. He said, Thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they learn to rest in thee. So when I accept the truth in God's word that God is in control of everything, that he has a plan and purpose for everything that's going on in my life, it's going to change my expectations. Why? Because I'm not going to be worried anymore. I'm not going to be full of doubt. I'm not going to be afraid. Why? Because I know and I recognize that God is in control. But if we're not properly related to God, it's going to deeply have a deep effect on our lives. It'll cause anxiety. It'll cause fear. It'll cause discouragement. Why? Because we're not recognizing that God has the final say and that he has a divine plan in our lives that he's working out according to his timetable. It's his time because it's the proper time. Even Jesus told us in John 14, verses 1 through 3, he said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. So if God is in control, if he's preparing a place for us, if he knows all things, knows all things, and to do good in their lives, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. 
So we have to appreciate the time that we have as a gift of God. We only have right now. And then that's gone. We don't know if we even have tomorrow. But we have to recognize that every day is a gift to God. Because when I say, you know what, God's in control. He is. When I believe in my heart that he has a purpose in my life and for my life and he's working it out, I don't have to worry anymore. I can actually relax in him. So many of us never relax in the Lord. He's the God of all comfort. He is the Holy Spirit who lives in us, who's alongside us, who's our rear guard, and we walk around it like we're defeated, like God's not for us. Really? No, he went to prepare a place for us. It says that he didn't leave us orphans, but he sent unto us the comforter. So we don't have to be alone. Of course he loves us. He, he loves us more than I think we can comprehend. But man, we should be enjoying life because when I relax in the Lord, when I realize that he's in control, then I can live and enjoy life. I can enjoy today. I don't have to worry about tomorrow or next week or what's going on in the government. I just have to pray. I have to watch and pray and trust the Lord. I don't have to let things and in, in, in people or, or events cause my world to fall apart and cause me to think that God's not involved or that he's a passive spectator. Man, that's a lie from hell. That's not true at all. He's intimately involved and, and he wants to have an intimate relationship with all of us. He's seeking such to worship him in spirit and in truth. But when I start to doubt the involvement of God in, in my heart, it's, it does something. It affects my attitudes, affects how I think, and it affects my actions. It's going to affect what I do. It's very important we see that. We can rejoice and do good and bring glory to God is what that says. It says to rejoice in verse 12 and to do good and knowing that it's a gift of God. And so when we apply these truths here that God has a reason and that he's in control and that time is a, is a gift to God, like I said, it changes our attitudes completely. It softens our hearts. It says, look at verse 14, I know whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken from it. God does it. Why? That men should fear before him. So when we apply these facts, these truths in our lives, the conclusion that we should all come to is to fear God, not be afraid of God, but to reverence him, to worship him, to adore him, to seek him, because we'll find him if we seek him, to abide in the vine, knowing that he in turn abides in us. But who initiates the process? We do. We start it. And then the Holy Spirit produces the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We realize that I'm not the captain of my own domain or whatever we want to think, but that God's the master of our fate, that he's the one that's in control. And that means when I really, truly believe that and accept what this, this, the, the Bible's saying in this passage, that means that I don't have to categorize the events in my life as good or bad. All I have to say is, hey, but God... And they say, well, that looks like a bad, you know, situation. You're, you know, you just had a wreck. You know, anytime I call my mom, you know, something happens, I get a flat tire. You know, I expect to be comforted, you know, amen. Yeah. You know, and I say, mom, I got a flat tire. You know what she'll tell me? Well, God probably prevented you from having a wreck down the road. And that's where I would just want to click and hang up. But you know what? It's the truth. It's the truth. See, she understands. She understands that God is always at work. She's lived long enough in the Lord to have that maturity to know that he's always at work. And that, that is true. That he may be delaying something. He may have allowed something to happen. He may have allowed sickness to come. I'm not saying that he causes it, but I have seen him allow it in certain situations. Why? To bring glory to his name. Every time. He's always at work and we can rest in the Lord not categorizing, oh, this is good or this is bad. No, it's God. Everything is in God's hands. So I don't have to worry about it. I just have to live for him today because we don't know if we have tomorrow. It's, every day is precious and every day is a gift from God. And we can rest in the Lord. It says in Philippians 4, 6 through 7, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with depression. depression. That's not what it says. It doesn't say or with fear or with worry or anxiety. It says with thanksgiving. 
knowing, or it said, let your request be made known to God, and it says, in the peace of God. I don't have to have the fear of man. I can have the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. It says, we'll guard our hearts, and it will guard our minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Man, that's good news. But also, we have to answer to God for how we used the time that we have on this earth. Everything that we do, we have to answer to him. And that's a huge message, as we discussed in the book of Ecclesiastes. Verse 15, look, that which has already been and what is to be has already been. And God requires an account of what is past. You know, it's a sin against God to waste time. We learned that when we talked about slothfulness. You know, God is the Lord of all eternity. But when we're lazy, we deny the limits of diligence and faithfulness, which is a sin against God. Because God is going to hold us accountable for everything that we do in our lives. This is not working our way to heaven. This is not about salvation. This is about how we live for the Lord on this earth as believers. And he's going to bring everything into account, it says. I don't know how he's going to do that, but he is. And so it's important that we say, man, listen, he is in control. He has a purpose for my life. I don't have to categorize things as good or bad. I just have to know that God's at work and that he's for me and take one step at a time, one day at a time. I don't have to worry about tomorrow. I can't live for tomorrow. I can only live for God and live for today. Because it's all that we have. Jesus even said in Matthew 12, 36 through 37, But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So what's the point in all this? The point is, is to enjoy life. Enjoy life. Do good in it. But remember that we have to give an account to the Lord. We have to answer to God for how we used the time, that gift, each day of our lives. There will be that day we'll stand before him. And, you know, I want to hear well done. Not, you know, my good and faithful servant, not just well done. You know what I mean? Yeah, I like medium rare anyway. But anyway... 1 Corinthians 4, 5 says, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart, then each one's praise will come from God. One more, Ephesians 2, 10. It says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ, and here's the reason, for good works, which God prepared beforehand. Why? that we should walk in them. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dearly Father, I just ask that you would help us properly relate to you every day regarding the subject of time. You indeed have a proper time for everything that takes place every day of our lives. Lord, forgive us for thinking that we're the master of our own fate. Forgive us, Father God, for thinking that something as we've categorized as bad, as if you don't know what's going on or that you don't care for us or you don't love us. Man, that's a lie from the pit of hell. There's no truth in that. You are God who is love. And I thank you that the work that you started in us, we know that you're going to complete it. So, Lord, help us remove the things that distract us and worry us and prevent us from living for you today. Lord, help us realize just how precious each day is. It's a gift from you. And then no matter what is going on, whether it be in sickness or in a lost job or in, 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 a, in a lost family member in, in, in the depression, no matter what it is, man, you know the proper time in the proper season. And I know that you're not going to allow anything that will happen to us more than we are able to handle. Help us, Lord, again, to relate to you in the terms of your proper time for what you have for us on this earth. Help us be a powerful and positive witness in the midst of that 
so we can point people to you and bring glory to your name, the name above all names. Just bless your people, keep them, and protect them. And it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet with me this evening? If you need prayer, of course, there will be people here to pray with you. But I pray you have a wonderful week and acknowledge really everything that God is doing in our lives. It's so easy to focus on the negative. And you know, a lot of times when we look at it, hindsight sure is 2020 sometimes, isn't it? We go through an event, we complain about it, and then we look back and say, man, God, thank you. <laughs> thank you for not answering what I prayed for. Thank you for being behind the scenes the whole time working. Amen? Amen. But if you need prayer tonight, let me tell you, now is the time. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait till next Sunday. If there's something in your heart that's troubling you, or maybe you don't know the Lord, I would encourage you to please come to the altar after Jesse closes out and allow us to pray with you. We're always here to that because prayer is the work. Power of prayer is in the one who hears it, not the one who prays it. Amen. And God hears our prayers. Amen. Church, Lord bless you as you leave this evening. God bless you.